Good morning. If you could uh, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 37. <coughs> now, throughout the history of the church, there have been periods when the people of God have been able to live peaceably and make the gospel known. But there's also been harder times when the church has endured periods of persecution. In the earlier part of my lifetime, Christianity was generally respected, and the church was seen to be as something good, even amongst people who do not believe in God. However, over the past 20 to 30 years in this country, there has been a significant change. Christians are now increasingly seen by many to be divisive, unloving, and narrow-minded. Christian morality, that is, a Christian understanding of what is right and what is wrong, is now considered to be outdated, something belonging to a bygone age that modern society has become ashamed of and would really rather forget. Increasingly, positions of power and influence are occupied by people who are actively opposed to a Christian way of seeing the world. They seem determined to marginalise Christians and to reject any Christian influence on our society. And I believe that we are entering one of those periods when the wicked prosper. So how should we respond? How will we cope? Now, although written by David 3,000 years ago, Psalm 37 was given to God's people for times such as these. And in Psalm 37, David addresses the issue of how God's people are to live when the wicked prosper. And now Marcus is going to come and read the psalm for us. This is a long psalm, guys, so we've got to dig in together. Uh, but I'm going to read it with great encouragement. Do not fret because of evil men. All be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will wither. Ah, oh, let's get my glasses. They will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Hallelujah. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. The justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord. And wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men are successful in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek, they will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose, whose ways are upright. But their swords will pierce their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord will uphold the righteous. The days of the blameless are known to the Lord, and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. But the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies will be the beauty of the fields. They will vanish, vanish like smoke. The wicked will <coughs> borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. 
Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be cut off. If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Right, Pete, my glasses are failing. Come here. Yeah, it's up to you now, bro. Yeah, that caught you by surprise. Here we go. I was young and now I'm old. Can you do that? <laughs> I've got to keep you guys away. I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever, but the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom and his tongue speaks what is just. The law of his God is in his heart and his feet do not slip. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, seeking their very lives, but the Lord will not leave them in their power or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil, but he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless, observe the upright. There is a future for the man of peace. But all sinners will be destroyed, the future of the wicked will be cut off. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and he saves them because they take refuge in him. Okay, as you were listening, I'm sure you'll have noticed that this psalm has three main themes, which I want to address each in turn. Now, first of all, there's much said about the wicked, and I don't want to spend too much time or emphasis on them, because although there are things we need to know about the wicked, the basic message of the psalm is that we as God's people should not be overly concerned by them. The second of these themes concerns the righteous, how we as God's people are to respond when the wicked appear to prosper. Lastly, but most importantly, the psalm has much to tell us about God himself. And I believe this is where we need to concentrate our attention. So let's begin with the, th the first of these themes. Throughout the psalm, there are many references to a group of people who are described as evil men, sinners, and the ruthless. But they're mostly referred to as the wicked. And the first thing I want to draw attention to is that this is how God has chosen to identify them. It's God that inspired David to refer to them as the wicked. But who are the wicked? And what exactly is wickedness? Well, wickedness has to do with twisting the truth. It means taking something that's been accepted as true and then changing it slightly so that it takes on a meaning that was not originally intended. The Bible tells us that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And we can see this same influence in the wicked in, as their evil intentions are, are often hidden behind the 
pretense of a good cause. They present themselves as messengers of a new understanding of what we accept as right and wrong. When the wicked prosper, good becomes evil, and evil is considered good. In verse 1, it talks about evil men who do wrong. Now, evil is to do with thoughts, intentions, and motivations. Who do wrong is concerned with their outward actions. So, these evil men who do wrong are men whose thoughts and actions are opposed to God. They're opposed to what he has made known about himself through his word, the Bible. They're opposed to his rightful authority over us. They deny his love, his compassion and righteousness. And they reject any idea of his future judgment. They refuse to acknowledge what he's done for us in terms of salvation and healing and forgiveness. And refuse to acknowledge what he has made known about the future in the new heavens and the new earth. They attack his people. They remove Christians, godly men and women from society, or at least severely limit their ability to influence it. They attack his ordinances, the structures that God has given us to live by, our identity as men and women, marriage as a uniquely special relationship between a man and a woman for life, and the family that emanates from them. Now, verses 12 to 15 speak to us about the character and intentions of the wicked. They're said to plot, to gnash their teeth, and to draw the sword and bend the bow. They plot against the righteous. Their malicious actions are planned, deliberate, willful, and determined. They target God's people, and there is nothing accidental or random about it. He says they gnash their teeth, and that speaks of violent intent, full of anger, spite, envy, and cursing. They draw the sword and bend the bow. The sword and the bow are weapons of war directed to inflict harm. The wicked have rep weaponry that they're prepared to use, and they're motivated with a desire to destroy and to tear down and to trample upon all those who oppose them or have the mis misfortune to be in their way. And often those most affected by their actions are the poor and needy. The wicked strive to slay the way of those who, whose way is upright. The upright are people who live the right way up. They try to live in obedience to God. The aim of the wicked is to turn the world upside down. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. In verse 32, we're told that the wicked lie in wait and set traps. This again speaks of intentional planned wickedness, all designed to reject God and destroy his people's faith in him. The wicked will often present themselves as victims, but they're anything but. They secure for themselves positions of power and influence, but they forget that they're vulnerable since God is in control and he will not leave them in power for long. In attacking God's people, their ultimate aim is to attack God. And how does he respond? Well, in verse 13, we're told that he laughs at them. Not because they are funny or that there's anything amusing about their actions. He laughs because their efforts are pathetic in his sight. The thought that they could rid the world of its creator is laughable. And even though they're full of threats, to him, they are no threat. Verse 13 also tells us that he sets their day. The psalm tells us that they will succeed, but only for a short time. There will be periods of history when they have the opportunity to carry out their schemes. But whether they like it or not, God has restricted them in their influence and limited their time. He allows them to remain for a time long enough to, to serve his purpose. And we may wonder, what is that purpose? And I, can, I must confess, I cannot give a complete answer to that question. But I do believe that part of the answer involves the strengthening and the refining of the faith of God's people. 
and the winnowing out of false believers from among them. So what, according to the psalm, will be their future? Well, on at least five separate occasions, the psalmist tells us that they have no future, for the wicked will be cut off. And although they've taken positions of power, the wicked cannot control everything. They cannot prevent natural disaster. They do not control the weather, the power of the sea, or the movement of the earth. They're powerless to prevent storms, earthquakes, or volcanic activity. Neither can they prevent food shortages, famine, or drought. They cannot control the natural world. They cannot prevent plagues of lo locusts or outbreaks of sickness and disease. So to sum up what we learn of those who God calls the wicked from this psalm, they are enemies of God, deliberately and actively opposed to him, his purposes, his ordinances, and his people. They are fragile and vulnerable, even though they believe themselves to be strong and powerful. Verse 21 tells us that they borrow and do not repay, which means they feel entitled to others' possessions and wealth and seek, seek ways to transfer that wealth to themselves under the pretense of a good cause. The wicked and ruthless have no future. They will be cut off. And though they prosper for a season, they are weak, they're fragile, which means they're likely to break down under pressure at any point. They're vulnerable and they will perish. And even though they seem to flourish, seem to be strong, firmly set and healthy, they will disappear without trace, or as verse 20 says, vanish like smoke, meaning so completely that even if we were to look for them determinedly, we would not find them. So let's think then about our second theme, God's people. Those who in the psalm are described as blameless, just, upright, and meek. But mostly they're referred to as the righteous. So what does being righteous actually mean? If I were to ask you to define righteous, what would you say? It's actually quite difficult to put into words. Firstly, when we hear the term righteous, we recognise it as something good. It's a word that describes the quality of a person's character and the behaviour that results from it. Yet I must confess to having mixed feelings whenever I hear that word. Since righteous is something we know instinctively that we ought to be, and yet deep inside, we know that we're not. We know that it's a positive moral quality that we should desire. Jesus said that righteousness is something that we should hunger and thirst after. Firstly, meaning that we don't have it. And secondly, that we should be desperate for it. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, you don't hunger and thirst for what you already have. What Jesus said contained a promise, they will be filled, which tells me that we are not the source of our own righteousness. But God has made his righteousness available to us, if we're desperate for it. The righteous, therefore, are those who will humble themselves and ask God to fill them with his. And we humble ourselves when we admit and confess, firstly, that we're not righteous, and secondly, we could never produce it within ourselves. Now, throughout the psalm, God has given many instructions to those he calls the righteous. There are do's and also do nots. And God's first instruction to those he calls the righteous, when the wicked take control of, power, of positions of power and influence, is do not fret. On three occasions, he clearly states that the righteous are not to fret. 
They are not to get unduly anxious or worried about the wicked. They're not to dwell upon and lament their apparent prosperity. The righteous are always are also told not to be envious, not to be envious of what the wicked have, their riches, their power, their influence, or even the status and esteem that people appear to hold them in. As we have considered earlier, wicked men will succeed for a time, but their time is limited and their influence is restricted. Like grass and green plants, they soon wither and die due to things beyond their capacity to control. So what other things has God instructed us not to do? We're not to become angry. We're told to refrain from anger and turn from wrath. So we're not to try and oppose them through rebellion out of a desire born of vengeance. And you might wonder why. Well, in verse 8, it gives us the answer. Because it only leads to evil. Fretting, responding violently, will corrupt us into becoming like the very people that we oppose. And God doesn't want that to happen to us. See, it's for God to deal with them, not us. Do we believe God when he says that he will cut them off? See, to try to do so betrays a lack of faith. Now, to fret, to become envious and to rebel are all very natural reactions when the wicked prosper. It's a very real emotion to want to remove them with violence. But we're instructed to turn from this instinctive reaction for our own good. Wrath and vengeance belong to God alone. And it's important that we understand this, otherwise we might be tempted to take these upon ourselves to our own destruction. See, only God can see things as they truly are. Only God has all the facts. And only he can deal with mat these matters righteously. And he will do this in his own way and in his own time. So what should the righteous do? Well, the overwhelming lesson from this psalm is to seek God. And that means to take deliberate action to come into his presence. And that begins alone in our quiet times. But it's also in corporate gatherings. As the writer of the Hebrews wrote, let us not forsake meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. <coughs> Verse three tells us that we are to trust the Lord. Verse five, to commit our way to him. That means to be completely given to living for him. We're told to enjoy safe pasture and to delight ourselves in the Lord. And that means through his word. That means to be immersed in the revelation that he has given us concerning himself. In other words, we need to make him the focus of our attention, to seek his wisdom, his counsel, his instruction and guidance. And when we hear from him, we are to believe him and put into action what he gives us to do. We are to live in trustful obedience, which means living as we, we know that he would want us to live. It means being available to him, being teachable. It means actively serving him by building up and encouraging his people. It means, being pre be pre it means being prepared to speak of him and to allow him to form his character in us. Also in the book of Hebrews, the word of God is described as a double-edged sword, meaning it cuts both ways. And as we read it, we find that it asks questions of us. And based on what we've just read, well, is he the focus of my attention? Do I want to learn of him? Am I willing to listen? Am I willing to take action? Am I willing to serve him and his people? Or is my attention continually distracted by the threat imposed through the prosperity of the wicked? 
Verse 7 says to be still and wait before the Lord. That means being patient. We may not get instant answers. It also means allowing him to initiate opportunities for us to serve. Verse 11 talks about the meek and how they will inherit and enjoy peace. Well, what's the word meek mean? Well, first of all, meek does not begin with the letter W. Meek does not mean weak. Let me give you a picture that shows what I think meekness is. Someone once likened meekness to the difference between a wild Mustang, a wild horse, and a racehorse. Meekness means having all one's abilities, energies, and strength controlled and directed to serving a useful purpose. And in this world, you'll find that there are two kinds of people, those controlled by self and those in control of self. And only a true Christian can be in, in control of self, since self-control is a fruit of the spirit. The meek are in control of themselves because God is in control of them. So the meek are those whose thoughts and strengths and abilities are harnessed and channeled towards achieving God's purposes in their lives. In verse 27, we're told to turn from evil and do good. Turn from evil. And I'm grateful at this point to, to Mike Cross, who the other week uh, told us about the word repentance and how it's derived from the French to think. So repentance involves thinking again. It involves thinking differently. It involves turning or changing the direction of our lives. But repentance is more than a turning from. It involves a turning to. Our thoughts and energies need a positive focus. So we're told to turn from evil and do good. See, having turned from evil, we need to turn to God and to allow him to work in us and through us because God often works through his people to show his love to the world. God's love is practical. It involves doing good. The Christian life is not passive. It's not simply theory and full of good intentions, but it's outwardly evident in the things that we do and say. As God's people, we are called to be God's love in action. Our lives should therefore make an impact, a positive difference, both individually and collectively as a body. Verse 29 contains a promise. It says, you will dwell in the land. And that is God's promise to take care of us. He will provide us with a place to live, somewhere to belong and call home. And he promises us an inheritance, giving us the assurance that we have a secure future. Verses 30 and 31 teach us how we can recognise who the righteous are. The righteous are recognised through their speech. It says they speak wisdom. And the Bible says that wisdom is more precious than silver or gold. Now, wisdom is the ability to make decisions. It's the ability to choose for ourselves what God would choose for us. Again, in the book of Hebrews, it says solid food. That is the word of God. This is Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The righteous, therefore, can make decisions since the source and influence of those decisions flows from a continual study and application of the word of God. Another feature is that they speak justice. They seek to speak what is right and fair and honest. Again, because the righteous make constant use of what they read in God's word. And thirdly, their speech is heartfelt. 
Their words are motivated by a genuine desire to honour God in what they say. Now, the righteous will also be identified by their actions. In particular, their generosity, as it says in verse 21. In contrast to the wicked who borrow and do not repay, the righteous will give generously. This is 34 to 36. We're told to wait for the Lord and keep his way. This is speaking of patience. And this is how we are to respond, by patiently getting on with living as we know he would want us to live. Verse 37. We're told to consider the blameless and observe the upright. Now, to consider and observe is about watching, thinking about and learning. God has made us in his image, which means he made us to be rational beings capable of making intelligent decisions. He has designed and made us to think and reason about the, about the things we see. He wants us to make observations and learn from them. And in particular, verse 37 instructs us to observe and consider the blameless and the upright. In other words, other godly men and women. What can we learn from their words and their actions? What do their lives teach us about God? Their lives will speak of his faithfulness. Their testimony will be that God has watched over them and kept them from falling when they stumbled and supplied their every need. Verse 37 goes on to assure God's people that there is a future for the man of peace. Well, what is this future? Well, it's good things to look forward to. In the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, we can read about the new heavens and the new earth, defined in part by what it doesn't have. It doesn't have any corruption or violence, death and the sin that leads to it. It's a world without sorrow or pain, a world without the wicked. It's a world based on love, commitment, peace and healing. Do we live as if we believe this? Now the most important theme of the psalm, bringing on to the third section, is actually, what does this psalm have to teach us about God? <coughs> what does it teach us about our Heavenly Father and, our, and Jesus our Lord? Well, taken as a whole, this psalm leaves us in no doubt that he is in control. He sees what is going on. He understands the plight of his people and the nature and the strength of the opposition we must face and the pressures that we're under. He knows the temptations and the, and the snares that are set to trap us and lead us astray. And he tells us these things, not to frighten us, but to prepare us for the challenges that we are likely to encounter. Often he does not take away the opposition, the temptations and the challenges we face, well, at least not at first, but rather he prepares us to overcome them by instilling us with his strength and guiding us with his wisdom. He builds up his people. He equips and enables. That's what grace means. He equips and enables us so that we can grow and mature, so that we increasingly become more like him. He prepares us for the challenges of life in a dark and fallen world, just as you would expect a loving father would do for his children. He is the perfect father. And if we look to his example, he will show us how to be the good parents that we want to be. Now throughout Psalm 37, David associates the name of God, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, with his actions. And every time we read the Lord, we are reading God's name, the name by which he made himself known to Moses. Last week, Les Wielden brought out something of the meaning of his name as the one who is continually present, the ever-present one. 
And each action and attitude that God's name is linked to brings out a further aspect of his character that reveals to us what he's really like and gives us a deeper insight of what his name truly means. And throughout the psalm, these things have been made known about God's character. The continually present one is generous. He's just. He lifts up his people. He's a helper, a deliverer, a refuge, and a saviour. So let's just briefly consider each of those things that the psalmist has made known to us about God. In verse 4, David writes that he will give you, that's his people, he will give you the desires of your heart. He's generous. He delights to give. He gives us good things that are pleasing to us because he knows what we truly need. He knows that our deepest need is to be loved, to be accepted, to be valued and to know that we belong. He designed and made us for this. He designed and made us, and since he designed and made us, it follows that he will know what our heart's desires are. And he has made us to receive his love and to share it with others. So how does he fulfill these basic human needs? Well, it's in the New Testament we find the answer. God has adopted us into his family. The family is where we learn to love. It's where we learn to depend on each other. It's where we learn to forgive and to be forgiven. Because healthy, loving relationships are fundamentally important to God. Family is where we learn to overcome challenges in a safe environment. It's where we learn to share not only our possessions, but also our burdens and successes. The family is where we learn to grow up. And he adopts us so that we can learn, grow and mature in the safety of his family. His family is a place where we experience his love and acceptance and where we discover how much we're valued. God has adept, uh, adopted us into his family so that we can develop his family likeness. In verse 6, it says, he will make your righteousness shine. That means he will form his character in us. This is not something we can do through our own conscious effort. It comes by dwelling. It comes by living as part of his family. Interacting with one another. Serving one another and learning from one another. Pretty much in the same way that a child develops the character of the family they grow up in. Now it says, he will make your righteousness shine. And since he will make it, it means that we don't have to draw unnecessary attention to ourselves. It means we can quietly get on with doing with the things that he has called us to do. It means that we can allow him to open doors of opportunity and provide invitations, for he will exalt us. And since he will make our righteousness shine, there's no need to defend ourselves or explain ourselves or justify ourselves. We can allow God to do this for us. Because he will uphold the justice of our cause. Verses 17 and 24 tell us that the Lord upholds the righteous. Our Heavenly Father wants good things for us. And he has promised to make a way for us even when the wicked prevail. He wants us to look beyond our circumstances. To realise these times of trial are not permanent but a necessary challenge to be overcome. And he wants us to listen, to hear, and to trust. And this psalm reassures us that he will reveal to us what we need to know 
and when we need to know it. Verse 18, we read that the days of the blameless are known to the Lord. Jesus knows who truly belongs to him. And he looks after those who are his. And those he has adopted are those who have already entered his kingdom. As Christians, we live in his kingdom now. And it's the king's duty to protect all those who live in his kingdom. Now, Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world. It's not restricted by geographical boundaries, for it's the spiritual kingdom of God's people, in God's place, and in God's time. And his promises for us are enduring. They stand the test of time and circumstance. His promises will not fail in the challenges that lie before us. Verse 23 assures us that he makes our steps firm. And though we may stumble from time to time, he will not allow us to fall. And in verse 19, we are further assured that his people will not wither when disaster strikes and food is scarce. You see, our Heavenly Father works on behalf of his people and his love is practical. He defends, he protects and he preserves his people. He's on our side. Verse 24 says he upholds us with his hand, which means he takes action to support us. And this was David's testimony in his old age, based on what he observed throughout his life. The conclusion that he had come to over a lifetime was, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Our Heavenly Father has called us to be a people who live to show what he is like. It's his practical love evident in our words and our actions, in the orderliness of everyday life. Are we hungry to know him as he has made himself known through his word? And do we extend God's love beyond our walls with the desire to see others brought in? Do we long to see the unrighteous made righteous? It's just. Verse 28 says, the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. Those who are just are those that he has justified on the basis of faith, and he will not forsake those who are faithful to him. Those who are trusting, those who are loyal, those who have faith in him. But what does it mean to have faith? Well, back in the summer at Quinta, we studied the life of Joseph. And in the account of Joseph's life, we are told that God revealed to him through Pharaoh's dream that there would be a severe famine that would last seven years. So what did Joseph do? Well, he toured and assessed the land. He calculated how much grain the fields could produce and ordered barns to be built in order to store it. He devised strict rationing plans to ensure that they had enough grain to keep them in the present and that which would last through the future, right the way through the famine. He spent seven years preparing for this famine, and all this would have been completely irrational behaviour if he hadn't known that there was a famine coming. And this, I believe, gives us a simple working definition of what it means to have faith. See, Joseph heard from God, and he lived like he believed it. Verse 40, we read that God helps and delivers his people. God is a helper. He helps us by giving us the ability to do things we could not ordinarily do. He builds us up. He makes us strong and prepares us. He gives us the inner motivation and desire to face and overcome the challenges and difficulties that we inevitably face as we live for him in a fallen and corrupt world. Because he wants us to overcome. He gives us encouragement, guidance and perseverance because he wants us to succeed and not to fail. He is for us. Verse 39, the salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. Salvation comes from Yahweh. He is the source of our salvation. 
This is his heart. His heart is to save. His heart is to rescue, to make better, to restore and to set free. And he wants to cleanse our consciences because he wants to release us from carrying around that sense of guilt and shame that prevents us from becoming the people that he called us to be. And that is to be living examples of his love. There is salvation in no other name. It's his will and desire to save. This is what he wants for us. He is our saviour. Verses 39 and 40 also tell us that he is a refuge and a stronghold. He is a secure defensive position, a place of defence and protection in time of trouble. As Christians, therefore, we should expect times of trouble. Now, when it says in time of trouble, it implies that there is not necessarily trouble all the time. And we do experience times of peace and prosperity. Those he has saved take refuge in him. God's people will seek his protection. They will take deliberate action to come into and remain in his presence. He delivers. God has made known that in this fallen world, trouble can and will enslave us. We may find ourselves put under the undue control and influence of the wicked. We cannot set ourselves free of this by our own efforts, intuition or bright ideas. We cannot set ourselves free of the wicked, but our Heavenly Father will deliver us from them. And he sets us free from those powers we cannot control. And he will set us free from their influence and ultimately their presence. He will deliver us from those that he calls the wicked. He will defend and protect his people and limit the ability of the wicked to harm us. Now throughout this psalm, our Heavenly Father has told us how we are to live in the present. And he has given us hope for the future. He has assured us that he will uphold us so that when we stumble, we shall not fall. And it's he who will deliver and save us from the wicked because we take refuge in him. God bless you all.